this is super exciting. Um, this is the second webinar in our series. Last week, uh, we had Manazar and, uh, and David Spencer from EBS talking about uh, the pulp and paper industry and wastewater toxicity in the pulp and paper industry and uh, explaining why identifying those events are so important for you know, maintaining optimal performance of wastewater treatment plants. Today is something that's going to be more, more typical, more commonplace across the industry. Um, uh, really excited. Uh, this is a project that we implemented with Wessex Water. Oliver, can you tell me when we started working with you guys? Was it last, was it last summer? Yeah, yeah. It was in that sort of ballpark, wasn't it? Yeah, fantastic. So we've been working with Wessex since last summer um, and uh, specifically around aeration optimization. So we'll get into that here now. Um, okay, yeah, I think I can get started. Okay. So um, in terms of housekeeping, um, if people have questions, you know, you can, you can put your questions into the chat section. Um, we have Jack Ambler, um, who's going to try and quarterback some of those questions as they come in. We'll probably leave most of the questions to the end. Um, but, you know, if you have questions through the, through the presentation, feel free to, to jump in and just put those in there. Uh, and we'll get to those at the back end of the, of the presentation. Okay. So in terms of who, who's going to be talking today, um, we have three people on, uh, in terms of panelists. Uh, myself, Patrick Kiley, I'm the CEO of Sentry. Um, we also have Mark Watton. So Mark Watton is the technical projects manager for QCL. Uh, QCL represent uh, Sentry in the, in the United Kingdom. Uh, and this, this project was, was implemented in, in, in Wessex Water. Uh, and Ivor Whittle then is the process optimization manager for, for Wessex Water. Uh, and Ivor really has been the man uh, on site um, and, and really, you know, a lot of the, the insight and thought process behind what we're doing and why we're doing it uh, has come from Ivor. So, so really excited to get all three of us together and presenting some of the findings uh, from the last six months of our aeration optimization work. Okay, fantastic. So in terms of the agenda, I've broken into three sections. Um, I'm going to start first and I'm just going to lay out for everyone. Not everyone perhaps is familiar with, you know, what Sentry exactly is. So I'm going to take maybe just five minutes and get everyone on the same page, just a couple of slides, just to introduce Sentry and, and frame it for everyone. Um, I'm then going to do something maybe a little bit different. I'm going to take a step back and I'm going to introduce for everyone again the basics of aeration optimization. Why we would look at aeration optimization and what kind of control strategies maybe people implement, implement uh, around uh, aeration optimization. And once we have that framework in place, uh, we'll hand it over to Ivor. Uh, and Ivor can then introduce his facility, the problem statement that they were working on, and then both of us will go through the data and some of the insights. Fantastic. All right. So let me get started. I'll start by introducing Sentry, and uh, here it goes. So, uh, what is Sentry? Some of you, I hope all of you, are, are quite familiar what, with what Sentry is. Um, Sentry is a novel type of technology where we grow active biomass um, on conductive surfaces. And we apply a very small voltage across two conductive surfaces. This, in effect, allows biology, the active biology in your treatment process, your wastewater treatment process, to grow on those surfaces. And it's that biology that consumes the exact same organic carbon, bioavailable carbon, that, that, that your other types of microbes in your, in your bioreactors would be consuming. The very key difference here is, in their respiration, these microbes don't donate their electrons to oxygen, or they don't donate their electrons to CO2 they donate their electrons to this surface and we measure the flow of those electrons. So in a very real sense, what we're providing with Sentry is both a measure of the rate of carbon consumption by that biology, which is really informative and really helpful, and also a measure of the mi microbial activity or the metabolic activity of, of that biomass. And then in terms of the platform itself, what we do is we place these physical sensors that look and feel like DO probes anywhere in your wastewater treatment process from a collection system, through to you know, influent monitoring, perhaps a primary clarifier, to the back end of aeration basins, through to nutrient bioreactors. That information can go to a dashboard or via 4 to 20 milliamp signal to an on-site SCADA. And there's three different types of data we provide. I'll just do this really briefly for everyone. Um, the first one would be using the platform, for example, in a primary clarifier to identify biological imbalance. So maybe periodically you have something coming into your wastewater treatment plant that is either um, a significant dilution event, perhaps it's infiltration, INI, 
or perhaps there's something acutely toxic in your wastewater stream that you're not familiar with or know about, um, but we can help identify those events. Uh, so you can see here top left, very steady state biofilm activity, something comes into the treatment process and a, a significant drop off in microbial activity. Um, the second thing we provide, and this really goes back to just what is it we're measuring? We have a biofilm on a surface and it's measuring the rate at which that biofilm can oxidize carbon, bioavailable carbon. So if we provide the biofilm more carbon, it's gonna give you a higher signal. If we provide it less carbon, it's gonna provide a lower signal. Um, so in that way, we can provide not just an estimate perhaps on how much BOD is available to the biology, but certainly how much BOD is being consumed by the biology in real time. And the third thing we do with the data is because the sensors themselves are biofilm based, because they like being in wastewater, because we don't want you physically cleaning the surfaces of those sensors, uh, we can place them in the wastewater streams. We can extract uh, really valuable insight over extended time periods. So this is one example. This is a weekly repeating trend um, from the influent. So a primary clarifier again of a, of a municipal plant that has some level of industrial activity in, in, in the collection system or discharge into the collection system. And the operator then can very clearly see, look on average, this is what's happening at my facility. So I can really pay attention to the Wednesdays, Thursdays, Fridays, when that big load is coming to my facility, because I know this is the biology you're telling me, this is when the load is coming. I can see the diurnal patterns. And then for optimization opportunities, I'm gonna look at those times of the day or those days of the week where we have lower microbial activity, where we have much lower rates of carbon consumption. Okay, so that's, that's the high level intro to Sentry. Physical sensors taking really relevant data from the biology on the sensor surface, relevant data that's, that, that's providing insight on the rate of carbon consumption um, and the microbial health of, of the process. In terms of the physical sensors and, and what it is, we have a control panel, a NEMA 4 X-rated outdoor panel, and then physical sensors that are installed almost identically to how you would install a DO probe or, or a pH probe. So just attached and just, just lowered into uh, and maintained in that wastewater environment. So now the fun part, um, or at least the fun part for me, um, I actually have to go back and do a little bit of um, first principles and learning again, just going back to why we're doing this, but uh, it's always interesting. So why would we look at aeration and, and how, how, how would we implement strategies around aeration optimization? So the first one, and I'm sure a lot of people are very familiar with this type of graph. Um, this represents um, uh, the, the, the amount of energy um, being consumed by the different processes at a, waste, a traditional wastewater treatment plant. You can see here, yes, aeration is the largest consumer of energy. Um, that's where a lot of the energy costs go. That's where a lot of the operational costs go. Uh, so you can see here 53% of the, of, of the wastewater treatment plant energy is used for aeration. That number can vary depending on the process. And certainly, we, you know, there are numbers as high as 75% of total energy going towards aeration. So clearly that's the low hanging fruit. And then why would we look to optimizing that type of, that part of the process? And really it goes back to the diurnal nature of wastewater. It also goes back to what, what are our key goals when, we're, when we're, we're, we're managing a wastewater treatment plant? And the key goal re revolves around robustness, reliability, and making sure that your effluent is always where it should be. So without optimization strategies, that almost dictates that you always have to set for that high point of the day. And if you're setting for the high point of the day, as you can see under the graph, there's a lot of opportunity that you're missing out on. So if you do have a good way to understand the wastewater conditions, if you have a very good way to understand the actual quantity and concentration of organics that are coming into your bioreactors, if you have that data, you can get much smarter about when you need all of that energy. And certainly you don't always need it on. Uh, the diurnal nature of wastewater dictates that there are opportunities for, for, for optimization. Okay, and then taking a step back again and going really, you know, well, when did people first start looking at, at, at aeration optimization? Uh, first attempts back in 1954, interestingly, in the UK. Um, so that was the first attempts at measuring DO continuously. Um, and then it was really in the 1970s that uh, the, the use of DO probes at wastewater treatment plants became much more, uh, much more common. Um, and, and let's be honest, that's, that's been massively successful. If there's one piece of equipment, I think that that would, would you know, have a, a significant um, gold star beside it. It would be the combination of DO probes with variable frequency drives and, and, and you know, that, types, that, that type of um, 
on-demand aeration is just a fantastic innovation in the space. But that's not where it stops. I mean, going forward from that, whether it's, and this is still going back quite a while, whether it's the 80s uh, more recently, but looking at those feed forward type opportunities. So whether it's looking at understanding directly the, the quantity of carbon that's in the wastewater, trying to use that to be predictive of, of what's coming into your aeration basins. More recently, again, uh, looking at ammonia-based control, whether it's feed forward ammonia-based control, which is super exciting as well, and using that information to understand the disturbance, understanding, better understanding those, those fluctuations in load and as it comes into the plant. So there's certainly been you know, lots of innovation in this space, but again, all of it comes back to measuring, all of it comes back to data. If you have good data, you can make smart decisions and you can save yourself money. Okay. So I will take one second here as well to really define some of the terminology um, and define the space again technically for a little bit for people. This is going to be high level. Um, um, we only have 30 minutes, but the very first way that you might control something uh, at a wastewater treatment plant would be, you know, with hard set points based around timers. So this type of open loop control. And that's fine if your wastewater is super predictable. If you understand exactly when things are coming, um, uh, maybe it's an SPR, I'm not sure. Maybe you're, it's an industrial plant and you know exactly when those batches of, of organics or waste are coming down the pipe. Um, but typically this type of hard set point, just regular timers, doesn't really work for wastewater treatment plants. And that's because of the variable nature. We don't exactly know all the time when that organic load is gonna shift. We have an idea, but you know, you need real-time data to, to, to validate that. If you have INI at your facility, if there's heavy rain impacting what you're doing, that can have a massive impact on what's happening. Even other aspects such as toxic compounds coming into your process, or even just the changing biodegradability of the wastewater stream. So to Im implement something better than, you know, fixed timers, we need, again, we need that data. We need that reliable data and relevant data from the biomass. Um, so then this is, you know, then we would move forward to like a closed loop control. So this is where you have that measure aspect. So we have a process, we have sensors, we have information in the wastewater stream telling us something that allows us to make a decision. And then that can, you know, implement an actuator to turn off a blower, turn on a blower, turn on a pump, close a valve, whatever it is. All the way to now where we have something that's even uh, more refined again where we have levels of cascade control so perhaps you're using multiple sensors um, uh, providing that level of insight not just one sensor but again the same problem always remains we have wastewater wastewater is not a, a pretty environment let's say for sensors if you're using light-based sensors um, and you are putting it in an environment where biomass loves to grow and it loves to grow on all surfaces um, it's a very challenging environment to generate that types of data that you can be that you can be really happy with and, uh, and rely on consistently. Okay, so then in terms of that aeration, well, what are we looking for when we're looking to optimize aeration? What kind of information do we need? So there's three key pieces we want. First is we want to understand the or, the incoming organic load. We want to understand how much food is available for the biomass. How much food am I going to send into this bioreactor? Ideally, you want to know that information in real time. Ideally, you want to know that information before it even hits the bioreactor. Uh, the second piece of information, yes, you want to understand your DO. You definitely want to be able to understand how much DO you're, you're providing to your bioreactors. Um, and, 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 and there's a lot of thought process, I think, and there's a lot of innovation to come, I think, in optimizing what the ideal set point is for that DO. Um, certainly, you know, your, your two milligram per liter uh, metric for, for DO is, is nice. Um, and, you know, we know that above that, it, oxygen really isn't, isn't limiting for the biomass, so that's why that number may be chosen, but it would be really interesting if we could look at lower DO set points and, and save energy that way as well. And then in terms of DO, I mean, it's good, it's really good actually, it's a, it's a, great, it's a great sensor and a great tool. The question is, is that, is that the best we can do or can we, can we complement that with other data sets? So if, there, if you have your DO probe in your aeration basin, it's almost in a way like an insurance policy um, it's, it's a little bit more retroactive. So it's having to deal with things as they've already happened. Um, and there's a lot of loss in that. So if we could understand before these things happen, if we could make smarter decisions about what degree of aeration we will need in the future, that would be really, 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 really exciting. Um, and that's hopefully where, where we're going to take this presentation and, and take some of the discussion today. And that's, that's what we're hoping to do with 
with, 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 with our platform. So with the Sentry platform, what we have is we have active biomass growing on conductive surfaces, telling us in real time how much organic carbon the biomass is consuming. So if we can place our sensors in those primary clarifiers and provide that measure of insight to the operator of the plant to say, look, this is exactly what is going to come in. This is how much carbon the biomass that are looking at. This is how much they're consuming. So let's try and use that to be predictive of how much aeration we're going to need uh, downstream of that. And for us, um, you know, the terminology that we use when describing sentry data, whether it's microbial electron transfer, if we're counting the electrons that they're, that they're generating, or perhaps it's organic consumption rate. So we can measure, you know, we're providing a measure of exactly how much organic carbon is being oxidized on that surface in real time. And what that type of insight will provide us, um, you know, we'll have more opportunity to be flexible around DO points. Um, we'll be more dynamic about where we're setting our DO before it's actually already, you know, in the bioreactor. And then again, you know, more data equals more reliability equals more opportunity for energy efficiency. Like we've said it at the start, if you don't have any data, you're not going to take any risk. You're not going to even perceive risk. You're not going to make any changes. You're just going to say, my job as a wastewater treatment plant is to clean water. I'm going to do that energy consumption isn't really my, 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 my key worry. But if you have really good data and reliable data, you can be a lot more confident about, okay, well, if there is an opportunity to save money, if there is an opportunity to have less GHG emissions here, well, if we have good data, then maybe we can do that. So, uh, and then, you know, just the whole concept of, is that a, you know, are we trying to be predictive? So this is a UK version of a time machine here. This is from Dr. And then this is our... <laughs> A North American version of a time machine, which I think is pretty cool as well. Okay, um, and then if we have that ability to, to predict what's going into these basins, is there anything else we can do? Are there any other concepts that we can look towards, whether it's uh, dosing um, chemicals into the primary clarifier, maybe we want to precipitate some of that organic, some of those organics, or maybe it's nutrients, maybe it's a different type of process like the pulp and paper industry that, that David and Manaz spoke about, where nutrients are limiting. So maybe it's something where we can be predictive of how much nutrients we need to add into our wastewater streams based on that insight up front. Okay, so that folks is the high level intro. So I've introduced Sentry, what it is, um, how we interpret the data on the sensors. And I've also looked at, you know, whether it's feed forward type insight and control of those aeration basins and, and understanding where the carbon's coming from, when it's coming from and when it's going into the bioreactors. So with that, We'll go over and we'll talk a little bit about the Wessex uh, case study and, and where the sensors were installed and the problem statement around that. So maybe Ivor, do you want to do you want to just walk us through the next few slides, discuss the facility and, and what you guys were looking to accomplish? Yeah, sure. Can, can you hear me okay? Okay. Um, so in, in essence, there are three treatment streams at this facility, but the, the two that we are primarily focused on, uh, which hopefully you can see in the overview, is the bath plant, which is situated at the top, and then there's a conventional activated sludge plant, which is at the bottom. So one thing that we have observed was um, the bath plant um, consumes more um, cost more to run per uh, megalitre than what it would do if we put it through the ASP. So we saw the potential benefit of having a monitor that measures the incoming biological load, which would mean that at periods of time when we are, the load is sufficiently low, we could send more flow and load to the activated sludge plant, which is the cheaper treatment stream than what it is to send it through the bath. Yeah, fantastic. So um, the unit is currently situated um, at the top where it says in the bath. So that's the bath splitter chamber, which then splits it to um, five bath cells. Uh, just those who are using lots of acronyms as we do, biological aerated flooded filter. And obviously, could you, maybe just describe that, could you describe that briefly, just what that is? Something yeah, sure, it. sure. So um, you get sort of two, um, you get two for the price of one, really, with a bath. So you get filtration as well as biological treatment. So um, the flow comes up through the bed of very small beads, plastic beads, which is where a biofilm attaches and grows to it. So it would resemble something like similar size to the polystyrene balls that you get in a bean bag. That sort of 
size to give you uh, put it into context and as the influent comes up through it gets filtered out and then the bath cells would take themselves offline and then go into a wash and then the dirty wash water would then go back to the uh, primary pumping station and then get settled out in the primary tanks and then back online again so yeah it's quite a energy intensive process because obviously you've got a lot of pumping back washing and then you have to keep the bed fluidized so you have quite high uh, do concentrations in there as well so needless to say it's more energy intensive but you don't need a downstream clarifier and it just for completion if you look in the top left hand corner um, there is a uv plant as well so all the effluent that has been treated through this works then goes through uv because it does end up um, downstream to where a uh, bathing water beat is okay um so that's a bit of an overview there looking at the top of the bath so to, to keep the beads within um their individual cells there is also a metal mesh which is probably about a meter down from that water level that you can see and that would sort of be similar to what you would expect like a washing drum machine type scenario where that would keep the beads and the diameters um, allows the water to come up, the, the uh, clarified water, um, but it would keep the beads and obviously the uh, biomass attached to it in situ. So um, i just um, going through on that as well. So that's then measuring the organic load that's then being passed towards the bath. There was, I'm just very quickly touching on that, there was COD uh, monitoring that was on there, but it was problematic, and, I'm, and I can't show to remember now, I think it was a, a UV type system, but we've never had a huge amount of accuracy. There, there is a bit of trade influence that does end up going into these treatment streams. Remember going back to the first part, there was three, that we have a very old UNOC system, which was primarily uh, there to treat the trade influent, which has got very high sugars. And one of the problems we've had when we've had online CO2 monitors is that it's not very good at picking up the single chain carbon chains. So um, that's why we wanted to look for an alternative and we looked for the Sentry and um, we've had some really quite promising um, results from it. So this um, actually, this, so this is cool. this is very recently, Patrick, isn't it? So it's our yeah, last so three weeks. I just I just did this this morning, so this is the last three weeks of data exactly. Okay. So yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll come on to it, I think on the the last slide. So this what it nice, does show is a really nice, clear diurnal pattern, which is what we're having now. Is um, everybody's been locked up and um, currently at home. Um, but yeah, and I just put this on there. I just put this on there, Ivor, just to show, you know, ourselves even that even when things are diurnal and you can see a very nice pattern, there's still variation, whether that's during the week yeah. Uh, yeah. or day to day. Um, yeah. Even the, the different peaks are, are can change by as much as thirty percent, and even the and the troughs as well can can shift by as much as thirty percent. So for me, that yeah. was super interesting just looking at it. No, no, it is, it is, yeah. So what, which one? The, the next slide, I think. Yeah, which then shows obviously the um, the different trends that we have, and, and obviously I think the, the, the bit that I think which was of greatest interest to us actually is I think it's the slide on from this again was um, when we had um, it's when we had the, the load periods, which if it was a normal diurnal pattern, it would mean that we would get the higher loadings during the day which is when you would normally associate it. But actually this work sort of was a bit of a paradox and that we were getting uh, the lower loading periods during the day. And the, the second graph, which sort of, yeah, between the 12 and 3 p.m., which is when it sort of has our greatest opportunities for doing optimization, um, which sort Which of is very strange. Very. Most, the, most facilities, we don't see the low peak. Low, usually that's the high peak. And that's why we were kind of scratching our heads. First, we were like, have we the time set right on this? Are we looking at this from yeah. North American times? Yeah, but, yeah. And, and, and it was a bit of a, it was a, bit of a quandary to us because, as you say, the, second, the next slide, it shows you because those, the, the red line there shows the high DO periods in the ASP. So we were getting elevated DO. And what it shows is it did, did correspond really well with when the century was showing our lowest biological loading as well. So there was a, a nice synergy which that showed and that sort of gave us a bit more confidence as well. Yeah. 
Exactly. So when you have high DO, it basically means there's no food left for the biology. So you'll have a very low uh, signal from the sentry platform. And when you have a high signal from the sentry platform, it means there's lots of food for the biology. They're doing their best to consume it. And it means that all of that oxygen is being consumed. So having those values uh, inverse, you know, have that inverse relationship, is a, it's a really nice one to see because it makes perfect sense. Yeah. Um, and then the other one here I'll point out, Ivor, and again, just clarifying, I think, as much as anything for us, that you know the industrial component does play a significant role because you can see on a Sunday when perhaps they're not doing uh, a lot of work, you can see how, how how depressed it is on average. So this is the average you know daily daily load basically per per day over that period, and you can also see the days of the week where it's it's obviously elevated. And again, yeah, I would assume that. So yeah, we do, we do always have a percentage of flow from the industrial uh, contingent being sent towards. Um, main, mainly we do a bit of switch swapping really because the it is nutrient deficient so we wouldn't want to send all the uh, industrial flow over which would be the ideal scenario because it is an, an incredibly expensive process the UNOS which uses pure oxygen um, but it is nutrient deficient so we only send a small component over to these two treatment streams and we also send a little bit of influent uh, crude domestic back the other way so we can try and compensate and give a little bit of nutrients back into the industrial treatment stream as well. Fantastic. So generally speaking, the, the, the data being used for process, process optimal, or at least the data being used to better understand the process and then that insight being used for, for improved operations. Yes. Exactly. So what I'll do with the next slide, Ivor, is I'll just, I think the next one is our, 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 yeah, our, our, our COVID slide. So just the fact that we've had the sensors installed now for, since the summer, and because of that, we've been able to understand, well, what are the trends at the facility pre-COVID, what are the trends post-COVID, and, and to be able to monitor that was, for us, really exciting, um, because as people change and as their habits change, it also impacts what's going on at the wastewater treatment plant, and for operators to be able to know that and understand that, I, I would assume, is very powerful. Um, do you want to speak to that just briefly? Um, yeah, I mean, I think what it does do is it just goes to show that um, there's a lot of people that are in the in, in that catchment that are obviously going and, and traveling about and going to work and, and, and there wasn't quite such a, a huge variable. And then it, it really has impacted that, you know, with all these people staying at home, we get this really uniform diurnal pattern that which wasn't necessarily demonstrating itself before. Exactly. So, and for people, for, people, for people at home there, just to explain... What we have here is the blue line is the is the traditional um, uh, weekly pattern, for example, in January. So, so as as I was saying, not necessarily as uniform. And then post COVID, we can see here that that things have become you know more more regular, certainly on the weekends as well. So yeah, and I think I think on that, Mark, I, I, I think Patrick, sorry, I, I think what it does is it, it shows that what was happening at the weekend is now mimic itself during the week, which it wasn't previously. Yes. Exactly. Things are, things are a bit more routine. For yeah. everyone. Yes, yes. And then even that, and just down here, so that's the overlay, so that's the aggregate data, but then as well, just being able to see that progression in terms of, um, you know, whether the weekly pattern is shifting, whether the organic load looks like it's coming up or whether it looks like it's flattening, and being able to see how, how, how that, you know, changes over time is also super interesting. Okay, so that's pretty much bang on our 30 minutes, Ivor. These, these are very fast. Um, <laughs> I, I really like it. Um, is there anything else you maybe want to comment on? I, I mean, this is really great. Thanks for your time. Oh, uh, no, it's fine. Um, yeah, so the, the next stage that we would probably try and look at as part of it, so in, in, as well as putting more flow to the ASP, um, we will hopefully try and, and, and that's going to be a few months away now because we've got to do quite a bit of uh, remedial work, but we would try and implement. Um, there was an RTC system that was previously installed real-time controller on the BAF system, which would switch BAF cells on and off depending on the incoming load. And we wasn't able to run that for a sustained period of time because of the reliability of the COD. So we are hoping that in, um, in a few months' time, we might get to a position where we can turn that back on, which again would optimise the site even further. So basically targeting the high energy pieces of equipment and looking yeah. to minimize their use where possible using the data uh, and, and generate those, those obvious returns out as well. For, for the yes. Customer. Absolutely fantastic. All right. Well, Ivor, with that, what I'll do is I'll just leave up our last slide. Um, and maybe, Jack, what you can do then is um, 
So that's fantastic. What I will say for people, generally speaking, so this is, you know, we're looking here on aeration optimization, but also any other questions around, you know, balancing, you know, F to M ratios would be nice. Um, with, with Ivor here, it was, it was almost as using the data to balance that hydraulic and organic load through the plant as much as optimizing the aeration part. Um, and also if there's any questions related to whether it's, it's a BNR application of this, so maybe it's more to do with just carbon in general and how can we better understand carbon going around the process. So if people have any questions on any of those aspects, uh, feel free to re reach out, just start sending those into the chat section. And maybe Jack, do you want to coordinate it from here? Yeah, great. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Pat and, and Ira. That was really, uh, that was really good. Um, yeah.